Good afternoon, everybody. We're glad that you're here. Welcome, welcome to Probable Means Possible. We'll let uh, our our guests um, come on in, watch those those participant numbers click up, and then um, we will get started in just a second. Glad to see all of you, especially on this um, bright sunny day here in the Twin Cities, and are appreciative that you're spending your afternoon, your late afternoon with with us today. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. So welcome to the second conversation on the Probable Meets Possible series. It's a collaboration between the Bell Museum and the College of Biological Sciences. We're bringing together University of Minnesota scientists in bio-based fields to talk about the probable challenges we face and the possible advances that could have a profound impact on our future. My name is Holly Manager and I'm the Director of Public Engagement and Science Learning at the Bell Museum. We're proud to be Minnesota's State Natural History Museum as well as a public gateway to research at the University of Minnesota. Our mission at the Bell is to ignite curiosity and wonder, explore our connections between nature and the universe, and create a better future for our evolving world. And so while presently our doors may be closed due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we're determined to live out this mission, to engage you and our excellent lineup of researchers in conversations that will explore big ideas and new directions in science conversations that will allow us to engage each other in some future thinking about what, what lies ahead for our health, for the environment, and for our planet. We are very grateful to our partners in this series, the College of Biological Sciences, led by Dean Valerie Forbes and the CBS communications team, including Stephanie Zenos and Claire Wilson, in addition to our own awesome Bell team. Thank you all. Now let's get to it, the reason we're all here today. Our special guests are Dr. Leslie Knoll, a limnologist and station biologist at the Itasca Biological Station and Laboratories, and Dr. Daniel Stanton, an ecologist, a Bell Museum associate, and assistant professor of ecology, evolution, and behavior. Our topic today, water what ifs. As ice cover and water availability change in our increasingly warming world, what does this mean for people and the planet? Leslie and Daniel will walk us through the state of their science, from the frozen lakes of the north to the Andes and the Amazon basin, sharing their insights about what changes in water and ice across Earth's landscapes might mean for ecosystems and the organisms, ourselves included, who live in them. We'll have brief presentations from each researcher and then open up the floor to conversation. A few technical notes first. Uh, throughout uh, the presentation, then in our conversation afterwards, please send in your comments and questions directly to the panelists by using the chat box below our team on the back end is monitoring those questions and curating those for our conversation. You may also have noticed that we have turned closed captioning on. Um, if that's distracting to you or you're not interested in using it, you can click on the live transcript script CC button um, underneath the speaker's uh, photos and um, just click to turn that off. I should also let you know that we are recording the webinar and we'll be posting it online on both the College of Biological Sciences website as well as that of the Bell Museum. In fact, our recording from last week's conversation on medicinal microbes is up on the Bell Museum website. If you just go to bellmuseum.umn.edu. Okay, so we're gonna start, um, enough of me talking, um, and by, we'll start by turning it over to Dr. Leslie Knoll from the Itasca Biological Station and Laboratories. Leslie, you're up, why don't you share your screen? Yeah, let me, let me get that set up. Oh, is it is it up now? Yep, you're up and ready to go. Okay, great. Good. Technology worked for me so far, so good. Okay, so um, thank you, Holly, for the introduction and also for inviting me uh, here to speak with everyone today, as well as to the other uh, conference uh, or the uh, meeting organizers. And I'm excited to talk about some of my research and uh, research of other scientists looking at the consequences of losing lake ice um, on what it does for people and also um, to lake ecosystems themselves. You might wonder um, how many lakes around the world have seasonal ice cover like we do here in Minnesota um, and it's actually quite a lot. Um, about half of the 117 million lakes periodically freeze um, every year. 
Uh, but at the same time, there are documented declines in ice cover um, that scientists have noted in the Northern Hemisphere. And if we look at just the um, Great Lakes area for the states uh, in that region where we are, um, since the 1970s, um, lakes have lost about five days of ice cover uh, per decade. Um, so it's quite substantial. And these changes have been related to uh, warmer winters as a result of a warming climate. You might also wonder, okay, so we know these, um, we see that these patterns are occurring. What does this look like for the future? And some recent work by Sapna Sharma and others um, showed that um, with under different climate warming scenarios, uh, a lot of lakes um, throughout the world might lose reliable lake ice. So future losses could impact anywhere from 30,000 to 200,000 lakes um, in as many countries as 50, affecting um, up to 650 million people. And so I want to show this visualization here that was done by the um, New York Times based on the Sharma work. Um, that shows in orange the lakes that no longer freeze every winter and then in that uh, blue gray color the lakes that um, are freezing every winter but under these different scenarios as I push play you see the the orange moving northward and the the loss in areas that uh, have reliable lake ice um, so so this um, is going to potentially impact quite a few locations and if you're curious about Minnesota, um, if you look carefully on the, the graph, um, most of the lakes in Minnesota will switch from being reliable to unreliable for freezing um, once it hits about three to eight Celsius uh, warming. And so what does this mean uh, to us, to the people that live by these lakes, and what does it mean for the lakes themselves? One thing that I've been focused on lately is the, the people end of things, um, thinking about how these changes in ice cover might affect um, kind of the cultural uses. And we can think of ice as um, natural capital or a natural asset that provides services like recreation and associated benefits such as uh, cultural identity. And you can see these different services and benefits in the two um, blue circles on this uh, graphic. And part of my motivation for wanting to, to look at this is that knowing the ways that we use ice helps us to identify common uh, values amongst ourselves, uh, which can help to enable environmental stewardship. And um, some research and um, just kind of your intuition um, for many people, kind of relating climate change and, and these uh, um, environmental impacts in a way of how we use the natural world uh, personally provides a stronger link to climate change than, say, you know, how a biogeochemical process might um, affect the system. Although that's super important, um, it, it doesn't have that kind of personal link to it. And then in a broader context, research has also shown that um, when we have a connection with the environment, kind of the sense of place, it leads, it can lead to positive behaviors and conservation and protection of that environment. And for the next couple slides, I just want to show the, a, a few examples of the wide variety of ways that people um, engage with ice all over the world. So in this slide, um, these are examples from across the world um, where people use ice for spiritual or uh, religious uh, ceremonies and practices. We also um, recreate out on the ice quite a lot. Here in Minnesota, we you know, hear a lot or uh, go out ice fishing, ice skating, um, playing hockey out on the ice. But cultures all over the world are incredibly um, creative in ways that they engage with 
with ice. Uh, there's an example in Russia of a marathon that takes place on the ice. This horse race in Switzerland has been going on um, for around 100 years. Um, so quite a diverse set of uh, ways to, to recreate on the ice. And like I said, in um, Minnesota, we are uh, tightly linked with um, ice fishing, um, both you know individually or out with your family, and also through organized activities like fishing tournaments that can have important economic impacts um, for a region. Um, and when you look broader, a recent survey by the federal government um, on ice fishing in the US um, excluding ice fishing on the Great Lakes, showed that there are up to 2 million anglers um, every year spending about $180 million um, dollars on ice fishing equipment. And I just want to give a, um, a quick example of um, ice fishing in the tournaments in Minnesota. And what I did with some of my colleagues was to look at how warmer versus cooler um, winters um, might be related to um, if tournaments were canceled or not. So we looked at um, kind of average winter air temperatures for a year to see if, um, if there was a relationship uh, to the number of canceled tournaments. And just to note, we, um, we didn't have a long enough time series to look at climate change, so this is really I'm looking just at the warmer and cooler time periods, but it helps to inform us um, about these changes in ice uh, cover and duration that we're seeing worldwide. So for this analysis, we looked at the northern and central part of the state uh, separately since there is a natural variation in temperature. And before I um, just briefly explain uh, the results, I just wanted to mention that we have a lot of tournaments every year in Minnesota, up to 100 tournaments, um, with as many as an estimated 60,000 people that get involved. And in a nutshell, um, what we found is what you, you, know, you might expect, that warmer winter air temperatures do indeed increase the percentage of canceled tournaments. However, we only saw that in the central part of the state and not in the northern part. Um, and and our results kind of indicated that it's because the central part of the state has, um, on average, some higher extremes, warmer extremes than what we get where I'm at right now in northern Minnesota. So that leads us to, to believe that as the climate, um, if it continues to warm, uh, we'll likely get an increased frequency of cancellations um, extending further north in Minnesota. So what's next? I talked a lot about you know, what we're seeing now and, and talked a little bit about some future trends. Uh, but what we really want to know is how do communities um, adapt and respond as well as how are the ecosystems themselves responding to these changes in ice cover. And so researchers are actively posing these questions to look toward the future. And so I want to end with a few examples of some advances, advances in Winter Lake ecosystem research and some of the approaches. In terms of uh, water quality, lake scientists have uh, traditionally not done so much work in the winters, not only because sampling is difficult, but also because um, lakes were assumed to be dormant at that time. We're finding that's not the case anymore, but um, to kind of highlight this, only 2% of peer-reviewed freshwater literature considered um, under ice lake processes. This was a recent study done um, to, to show that. And so because of that, um, we really don't know what the impact of decreased ice cover will be on our lakes. But researchers are beginning to, to look to this question. Um, this is, these are some article headlines in the popular press for, from some work uh, based out of researchers from the University of Minnesota Duluth who are trying to explore uh, this exact question. And um, researchers all over the world are also kind of getting, uh, trying to tackle this um, as 
some scientists have been predicting that ice cover may protect uh, things like our summer water quality by trapping uh, nutrients, buffering the waters against warmer temperatures in the summer, uh, both of which could help to limit the growth of um, harmful algal, algae or the algal blooms that you hear about in the news that um, have toxins that can be harmful to people and, and animals. Uh, research, researchers are also predicting that um, ice might be helpful in limiting invasive species establishment due to harsh conditions or potentially even protect habitat for certain species um, by protecting against winter storm disturbance. And then technological advances are also um, really helping push the science forward. Um, new sensor technology um, is allowing us to measure um, what's happening in the lake year round, including under the ice and um, in those shoulder seasons, like during ice breakup and ice formation, where it's really unsafe to get out there. Um, so we're able to look at things like temperature, um, light, the amount of oxygen, the amount of algae in the water to really get a better handle on what's going on in these systems in the wintertime. And uh, also satellite imagery is playing a role um, helping scientists to track ice cover and snow cover in a, a remote way. And finally, I want to end um, with citizen science. Um, overall, citizen science is becoming more active and common around the world, and it's really helping to push science forward as well, even in the, this ice uh, research area. Um, this example on the right shows ice in and ice out data collected by citizen science observers all over uh, the, the state. And these records provided by citizens are really important part of our long-term record and provide a lot more data than what we could get otherwise um, as scientists. And so together, these sorts of efforts and the research advances are really allowing us to better predict and to adapt to uh, changing winter lake conditions and air temperatures. Um, and so with that, um, I, I'd like to uh, end it and hopefully have lots of good questions and discussions and pass it back to Holly. Awesome. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, everybody at home, let's let's give Leslie a round of applause. I know it's hard that can't, you can't see that. Uh, Leslie, I wanted to ask you a question because um, just in between as our transition period, so you're a limnologist, a lake biologist. Right. How did you get to studying the the people side of things, as as you said, understanding sort of the, the at where culture and right. lake intersect? Yeah, because it is um, it is a little bit of a shift for me. Um, but yeah, I, I think a lot has to do for me personally with my job here. I work at a, um, the Atasca Biological Station with the University of Minnesota. And so I'm really embedded in the, um, the natural world, world every day at work. And also I see all this recreation occurring and every day in a way that I wouldn't normally being on campus, you know, in the city. And so it's really um, made me think more and more about how people are interacting with the environment. And then I um, ended up talking with several colleagues from around the world who um, had similar interests. And so we got together and, and did this project. So I think for me, this was definitely a case of, you know, my day-to-day -day activities and, and uh, being influenced to kind of shift some of the research I was doing. Wonderful. Well, thank you. We'll have you stop sharing yeah. your screen. And while, while right. you're doing that, I'll remind all of our viewers out there, all 90 of you, welcome. We're glad you're here, uh, that we were taking questions for our conversation after the presentations through our chat box. So please make sure that you type in your questions there so that we can have a really rich and fruitful discussion. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Daniel Stanton who um, is an assistant professor in ecology, evolution, and behavior uh, at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. Daniel, the floor is yours. All right, and hopefully it's sharing all right. Um, yep, you're good. Yeah, so I actually got my start as a limnologist 
as an undergrad at the University of Wisconsin and spent most of my, in my sort of start in science was spending my summers on lakes in northern Wisconsin. And then from there moved to land and most of my research currently is on land plants, but still like something there. Uh, so my big interest is in how plants interact with their environment. And I get particularly excited about sort of unusual, non-traditional types of plants in more extreme environments. Not because I'm masochistically attracted to going to really cold or really dry, or really high places, but because in those harsher environments, it sort of pushes other processes, other factors, other features of how plants interact with, with their surroundings to the fore that are kind of hidden in the condition when conditions are good. And so it gives us these insights into these added little pieces that we can bring back to more comfortable places. And so what I wanted to address today is sort of thinking about how vegetation, we expect vegetation to interact with changing climates and especially with a view towards water resources perhaps. And the, the tricky thing is that a traditional view of plants and water is that we have a climate, the weather happens, and then that drives what plants can grow in a given spot. Whereas in reality, on a local scale, it's much more complicated. Plants change their surroundings. And we kind of know this intuitively when we go stand under a tree to get in the shade on a hot day. But if we sort of to put it into sort of rough numbers, think about it, if you stood under a tree and you sort of drew a line straight up into the air, you might hit five, 10, even in some cases, 15 separate leaves before you got clear of the canopy. That means that the surface area of leaves in that tree is five, 10, or even 15 times the surface area on the ground. So one square foot of ground is covered by 10 square feet of leaves. That's a lot of surface area for water to evaporate out that's pulled from the soil. It's a lot of surface area to intercept light and change how much the ground warms up would intercept dust that might have nutrients in it. And so it's a huge effect and we sort of know this and then we kind of forget about it when we talk about plants and climate on a regular basis. And so when you add to that, that they change how air flows, having a forest, having a plant present really drastically changes the local conditions. And that's not just entirely local, but once you start to add a whole bunch of plants into a landscape, you can have feedback effects on the climate because you're moving so much more water from soil to air. There's the sort of classic example of this is Ascension Island. It's this remote island in the South Atlantic where in the early 1800s, the British started planting trees onto what was a largely desert space and now it has forests and this led to sort of this idea that you can put trees in and you can get climate that associates with those trees. Now that thinking is too simplistic that led to a lot of the plowing that was behind some of the plowing under of drier prairies in the western less of the dust bowl. So it's not it's not like you can put plants and get climate but there is an interaction there. And part of what makes this so complicated and what is such a big, exciting challenge moving forward as we forecast how climate change is happening is that we've got these plants create these really buffered local environments. And that means that what we see could get drastically changed the moment you remove the plant and you get a sudden change. It also means that you could have changes in the overall climate that mean that become worse for the plants, but because of these local effects, it's buffered. And locally, we can have sort of these legacies that are persisting, but not able to perhaps grow new trees. And this is something I think about when we see news stories about these big concerns of say, will the Amazon basin or the Congo basin collapse? We know that over the past 100,000 years, those huge rainforests have been mostly savanna at times, and they've gone back and forth between those conditions. And so 
part of the trick is that at the same rainfall, you could have savanna, you could have forest. And one of the, the challenges is if you take out the forest, maybe it won't grow back. And I want to be thinking about what this collapse itself will actually look like isn't that we wake up one day and there's no forest, but rather that the conditions are such that once you remove the trees, they're unable to come back. But it doesn't mean we won't have pockets where things are still persisting, that they could sort of rebuild from. It's going to be a much more complex picture. And it's one that's going to be where the broad climatic effect is going to be masked by all of these local effects. And this is a complicated thing to forecast and to understand. And so I want to pivot towards talking about some of the tools and advances and directions that, with my own bias perspective, I see us going within this field for understanding this, that we can make our best guesses as to what's going on. And fundamental to this is interdisciplinary work. This is a picture from some work I'm doing in the Andes where I work with geologists and geographers and glaciologists and hydrologists and I'm the plant person because everybody else brings all these other things to the table but we can't just pretend like we can work on one system in isolation we need people who work from very different perspectives all tying this in to be able to unify these complex pictures and people who are willing to work at different scales be it from local how does a plant leaf work and try to combine that with how the weather works at big scales. So that's a huge first piece. A second component, and this is one that Leslie brought up as well, we're making huge advances with instrumentation and getting smaller instruments and cheaper instruments means that we can be measuring a whole lot more things in parallel. We could make, it's a lot easier to continuously measure different conditions in different places and to use that to really start to break down a lot of the biases that we have in our perspectives where we used to be if you only afford a weather station you stuck that out in one spot and now we can start to measure what's going on in different parts of a tree canopy as well as what's out up in the air we can be tracking what's going on in the winter when people when you're, it's hard to get out your instrument doesn't work or, or classic instrument didn't work or for us here in Minnesota, in the spring and fall, when it just gets kind of muddy and not a whole lot of growth is going on, there's activity and understanding what's happening then will be key. And then bridging between these local scale measurements and what's going on at larger regional global scales is, is something where drones and satellite imagery is really making a huge difference. And the, this quality of stuff, information we can pull out of drone flights is amazing for understanding what's going on. And then I think what a lot of this instrumentation and is going to help reveal is that there's a whole lot of inherent biases on how we've understood plants and their interaction with the world that came from practical limitations. There's biases in geography people have tended to work where it was easy to go to or was close to universities and that gives us a very north american and northern european bias that's maybe not representative of some other parts of the world there's also a lot of seasonal bias as i mentioned and there's a lot of phenomena that are just a bit harder to measure that we're not tracking that play smaller but really important roles like fog and dew. When I showed that picture of Ascension Island, part of what made it possible to forest that island was that there were these coastal, these clouds that came in off the ocean and hit the peaks. And with no vegetation there, there was no water input. Nothing, but once they put the trees there, they were able to benefit from that added moisture. And so that really, but that was absent in say the prairie. And so getting those nuanced factors in is something I'm seeing emerging in the literature and is going to start to shift how we think about, I think, even the places that we, we sort of know. And one of the key components of that to sort of harp on a little bit is thinking about what wetness and surface wetness. The classic idea is that 
plants take up water through their roots and lose it out through the leaves. And we're increasingly seeing that some plants, quite a few plants can take up water through the leaves and also just the time they spend with wet leaves that because it messes with our instruments, we have tended to just sort of measure around is actually really critical to understanding what's going on. On average, plants spend about 30% of the time with their leaves damp and therefore not convenient for traditional measurements. And so there's a lot of pieces there that I think as we get those, we'll be in much better shape for understanding some of these local factors and these complex local dynamics so that we can put that back into a big picture. And so to summarize that back out, vegetation is going to change in big ways as our climates shift. But it's, and those shifts in vegetation are going to have impacts on how that climate shifts. But local buffering effects are going to mask and hide some of the most obvious drastic changes. And so it's going to be a more complex picture, even as it's happening. And so that can sound negative. The flip side is that those local buffering effects also will allow things to persist and they may be key to help building resilience because that's what we can build back out from to preserve or rebuild pieces of ecosystem that we wanted to keep. And with that. Yeah. All right, thank you, Daniel. Much appreciated to everyone out there. Let's, let's give Daniel a round, a round of applause. Um, I'm gonna ask you a question first and then we'll kind of open it up for conversation. So in the meantime, I'm also gonna ask everyone out there to um, continue to type in your questions into the chat box. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing um, what you're interested in knowing about from our, our two awesome experts. So Daniel, I know that uh, you've spent a lot of time working with and curating the lichens in the Bell Museum's collection, and so you are an expert on lichens. And while technically they are not a plant, um, I wonder if you might expand on how lichen, you keep talking about how plants change their environment and interact with their environment in that way. Could you expand on like what, what um, how do lichens do that? Um, and what kinds of impacts might you expect from um, climate change on that interaction? Yeah, yeah, so you're right. Lichens aren't technically a plant. On the other hand, they're a multicellular organism that's, they act like plants in a lot of ways. And so most of the tools and perspectives are the same. And I actually kind of like them because of that, because it's sort of an independent attempt at being a plant on land. And so if we can get, it allows us to try to get at more general rules that might not just rise from the particular lineage that gave us our current land plants. That's, that's sort of one side of things. What's exciting to me about lichens and mosses is that they are what we call desiccation tolerant. So they can, a lot of them can handle drying out and re-wetting. And, and they also usually don't have any roots. And so they function much more as sponges that turn on and off than they do as pipes. And so if we sort of really simplify it down the way the, the climate model is like it, a tree, a classic plant is a pipe that's really good at moving water from the soil up into the air. And it moves it up faster than evaporation would. Mosses and lichens are a layer of sponge that hold moisture and slow how much rain goes into the ground. They slow evaporation back out. If they're covering trees, the surfaces of branches, they change the moisture dynamics in it. And so it's a sponge versus a pipe type of model. Very cool. Thank you. Um, oh, good. That I was going to ask you to stop sharing your screen. I'm going to encourage people to keep up with those questions. Um, I'm going to ask uh, a question to both of you for you to have, and hopefully you'll talk to each other instead of the, to, to, me, to me. So, um, Leslie, you, you used the word loss in your presentation, and Daniel, you were talking about collapse. <laughs> um, and all of these things are very... Um, very scary and have will have significant consequences on on ecosystems and the services that that they provide. And so um, my question for you is with so much like loss and collapse potentially in, in the future, um, do you have any hope for us or are there what is what is the science um, telling us in a way for for humans to 
to be hopeful in, in the face of that. Well, I don't know, Daniel, do you want to take a <laughs> stab first? Or? I'm left you speechless. Uh <laughs> yeah, I'm, I mean, I think um, it, you know, it is a, a, a dire situation, um, but I, I think we need to have some hope, or I feel like I need to have some hope. And a lot of um, what I'm doing is to try to um, help, you know, bring to the forefront, like what, um, what is happening and what might happen. And especially in terms of the kind of work I talked about with the way people are using ice, um, I think it's, it's helpful to, to put the physical changes that we're seeing in ice cover in the context of how people enjoy it and use it. Um, even, you know, up here where I'm at in Northern Minnesota, I hear a lot about, not a lot, but sometimes I hear folks say, you know, I used to always be able to ice fish by Thanksgiving and now I can't. So I think that's an opportunity to um, kind of begin that conversation um, and, and kind of help bring the awareness a little closer to home because I think a lot of a lot of news articles are you know maybe a little more abstract um, so this kind of helps bring it a little bit closer to home and I think too we also you know need to start thinking practically about what can we do to adapt and um, make some changes um, and so starting and that's not what I work on um, but starting to, um, to to begin that conversation um, more broadly with communities and what they value, I think is helpful. So I think those all can provide some hope, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Daniel, what about you? Where, where do you find hope in the face of collapse? Well, I guess I, I sort of stand on the, the, the change, the changes themselves aren't necessarily inherently good or bad. What's problematic with change is usually unpredictable and fast change. And so, being able to work out tools to slow the rate of change, be it locally with the, the, the climate buffering or something like that, but also changing our behavior so that we are reducing the rate of change and we're getting the tools to be able to predict and prepare for it and adapt seem like the huge pieces. For some of these changes with climates, the, the lag times and these effects are such that things are going to keep happening no matter what for some period of time, but we can at least be better prepared for it when we can try to sort of mitigate that as best possible. I don't know if you call that hope entirely, <laughs> but it's, yeah. Okay. So Gail, who's tuning in, um, asked a question. What do you worry about the most about warming? And can you identify any place or have any examples of positive change? I worry the most about, in terms of, of Minnesota warming effects, about loss of winter. Mm -hmm. Because I think so much of what drives both in water and on land the dynamics of this is this really kind of intense seasonal event that happens with winter and there's a whole lot of nuanced changes that will happen in losing winter including more freeze damage to plants as we get less snow and sort of things that are slightly counterintuitive that are what i think are going to have some of the biggest impacts especially because winter is what we know the least about yeah, and Leslie, I was, what about you? Yeah, and I was going to say, Daniel, that was something in both of our talks that I noticed that yeah. the certain seasons are understudied in, in your world, too. So we definitely have that commonality. And yeah, I agree. I think winter is um, something I worry about uh, for, for this state, particularly as well for, for some of those same reasons. Um, but a positive change um, that I could try to identify, um, at least in terms of um, ice. Uh, the 
there are a lot of structural infrastructure damages from uh, freeze and thaw of ice. Um, and so having that reduction should um, help with those sorts of um, damages that, that occur with, with infrastructure at times. So, so there, are, there are some positives out there. Uh, so um, Jatine has a uh, question that said great presentations, by the way. So thank you for that, that, that feedback to our, our presenters. So um, one of the, the things that we've been hearing a lot in the news during this COVID era is that um, nature seems to be rebounding um, during this time. So like whether it's reduced CO2 um, emissions and better air quality, reduced road kills. I just read an article about um, salamanders making it across the road more to get to, get to their, their um, mating habitat. And so we're wondering, like, what are there changes or impacts you expect to see as a result of this global slowdown in, in your systems? Or have you thought, have you thought about, about that, that potential effect? I, I, I haven't thought about it so much in a real kind of specific way for my systems. I've, you know, been thinking about what I think some of us are seeing too in the news about the reductions in pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. And I think in a broader sense, um, I think this, this slowdown um, and all these changes that we're seeing in the environment could potentially be used in a positive way to, to highlight, you know, what um, investments in sustainability and energy efficiency might be able to give us. So I've been thinking more in the, the, the broad context, I guess, um, rather than my specific systems. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't sort of got any like really specific things that I wish I was allowed to travel and go out and measure, but I know people who who are like this is I mostly try to avoid places where there's sort of reduce the human impact factor just because it's one more complicating element that is addition is hard to understand and so it doesn't really change my spaces on the other hand I think it's going to be really interesting where we where people have been able to measure the changes either because they had cameras in place or they had instruments measuring it this is where the, the remote measurement instrumentation is playing a huge role in being able to see how these changes are happening in a way that we couldn't have in the past yeah, i think that, there's going to be some really exciting stuff that comes out of this of what even like a couple months change in behavior could do yeah, but like not, like those automated not. sensors and whatnot that we were talking about. Those those will be quite useful, right? Because yeah, we like can reduce boat traffic on a lake may not matter, but maybe like this is a one sort of a rare chance to do that because you, you usually don't get to shut down a lake. Right. <laughs> help well, not to and come for, and yeah. that was I think a, a point that Jatine, the person um, who asked the question, was asking, like that the fact that people weren't able to go fishing for a period of time, potentially, that, that could there also be, be those impacts. I want to continue on that theme of like instruments and um, increased capacity with, with instrumentation, whether it's, you know, remote sensing or sensors, sensors on the site. So with better instrumentation comes lots and lots and lots of data. So how how do you deal with all that? I mean, I think if there, I imagine there's a yay boo where you're excited to have all this data, but that means that like it, it's incredibly intensive to wade through that data and try to understand um, patterns and processes that might be happening. So I was hoping you could talk a little bit of, of, about that because um, I think that's a flip side of instrumentation that people might not not think about very often. Right. And yeah. I, I'm actually curious of uh, what Daniel has to say. I'll kind of be similar to, to my thoughts on the instrumentation that we use in lakes. But um, yes, that's a really good point, Holly. There's all these bells and whistles that are super exciting. And then you've just got gobs and gobs of data and all this, um, the back end work. And so this brings to attention uh, what Daniel brought up earlier too about the interdisciplinary nature of science and the need to work with other uh, folks in different expertise areas. And so 
um, it's really helpful to partner with somebody who has that kind of computational background and the, the IT, the computer um, abilities so that you can automate some screening for, you know, out like outliers or quality uh, issues in your data for things that are just outside of what's practical. So you really, I mean, unless you have those skills yourself, um, it, it's really uh, for the water world, quite common to partner with people who have that kind of expertise. And then there's also um, different scientific organizations and groups uh, either formally organized or grassroots in nature that um, are trying to help push this forward and in, in my uh, lake world. So yeah, it's it's something to figure out at the beginning and not after you put it out there because that's a mistake that can be made. I would definitely echo Leslie on the bringing in interdisciplinary components. And this is, this is where there's a huge role for data scientists and analysts in some cases to develop tools, just even computationally to handle these huge data sets that we put out. On a, I think it also, for me, for, for what I use it for, it's, an, it's been an interesting push towards really making sure I can understand first principles and, and why I'm taking measurements. Because if I can measure, if I can get this monstrous stream of data, say just even temperature data at five minute intervals, there's so many different ways that we can tease that apart. And we can look at minima, we can look at daily minima, we can look at fluctuation, we can, there's sort of, you can pull it apart in hundreds of different ways. And so that's a real, it sort of forces me to think about before I even go into dealing with that, what I expect from physiological understanding of these organisms from the organisms themselves to be driving factors so that I can dig in and see whether that applies. Whereas with sort of simpler historical data where it's just like daily temperature, daily rainfall, you look at how things relate to those two factors because that's what you got and then you make your inferences off of it. And there's not a lot of process-based physiological understanding that you can apply. And so it's it's a challenge, but it's, it's I think, a useful challenge to sort of push me to delve into, into the details of what I think actually matters because I have the ability to try to pull that out. And sometimes it is clearly irrelevant and that's good. <laughs> that's how we learn. Yeah. Uh, we have a few questions that are kind of directed at you individually. So there's a question um, for you, Leslie, from Janice. It says, loss of lake ice impacts lake water evaporation and lake levels. Are you or does it, are you working with people who are studying this? Um, no, I'm, I'm not working on that uh, myself, but I know it is a, an active area of research and um, the Great Lakes in particular have a, a bit of a uh, focus on that um, because you know there's in some cases um, loss of ice might lead to more evaporation and uh, lower lake levels although that's not always true there's a lot of other factors at play um, you, it's kind of the difference between the air temperature and the water temperature and, and wind and it gets complicated um, and I'm not the person to speak too specifically on that, but um, but yeah, there's definitely a lot of um, interest in that area. But I'm not I'm not currently working on it. Thank you, oh, Daniel from Stephanie. We have a question um, referring. You were talking about the local buffering effects, and so she was asking, where do we see those buffering effects now? So I know you kind of all over in that you can get into the shade of a tree outside and, and see that on, on that scale that's sort of a trivializing answer one of the the really classic ecosystems in which this was first talked about as a phenomenon we have an ex an example of in northwestern minnesota in the in the uh, aspen parklands uh, the work was done in the late 1800s in russia looking at steppe and some of these open spaces but we've got these prairie this area in, north, in the northwest of the state where you can have prairie or you can have a dense stand of aspen. And the soil's identical, the climate's identical, 
it's just if you start with enough aspen, it doesn't burn, it generates moist conditions, more aspen grows and it spreads. If you start with prairie, the prairie maintains itself by staying drier and not good conditions for aspen to grow. And then you get a really extreme year and you can switch from one to the other, either through burning the aspen or through having it so wet that the aspen establish. And so you've got these alternate stable states that can be happening that maintain themselves just through the feedback. And there's a lot of examples of that, but that's a nice really, it's when the ground is completely flat, when there's sort of all of these other factors that could play a role are eliminated, it's a really clean example. That's very cool. Um, so one of the things that, and this is, this is my question now coming in because our audience needs to ask more questions. I think something that's happened at, with staying at home is that like the pace of my life has slowed. And so I'm able to um, observe like incremental change happening over the course of spring in a way that, that I, I haven't really slowed down to notice before. And so watching, watching this change over time. And um, I think both of you have been working at field sites kind of over longer terms that you've been returning to over and over. And um, I'm wondering if you have any um, insights or, or stories about um, changes that, that you've observed by kind of returning to a place or being in a place and seeing, seeing change over, over time, a different scale, obviously, than what I'm seeing in my yard, but, um, but that, that idea of change over time. I, Do you have a favorite field site you go to over and over again? Oh, of course, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, um, well, all the lakes in the park in Atasca State Park are quite, quite lovely. But um, I haven't, I haven't been here long enough to, I guess, notice any like long-term changes. This is my coming on my fifth summer here, so I do though um, notice what you're saying though about because I am here all the time, like what you're experiencing now is something that I'm missing right now because I'm working from home and not going into my office, which is inside the park. Um, that I, I just had to go drive there the other day in the park to see when the bellworts were coming up because I, I'm so used to being like, oh, it's, it's springtime or the swans are coming back. And so I guess I'm having kind of the, the opposite reaction but um but i think it's it's really important and this is kind of a tangent but i think it's um it points to the importance of natural history overall um, because i think we get uh, even scientists right we get stuck on our computers all the time and and you may be only get to go to a field site for a couple of days and then go back to um, your campus and so the, the importance of this observation and the natural science is what um, one way that can lead to a lot of discoveries that you wouldn't just, you know, have otherwise. So it's kind of taking it on a bit of a tangent, but I think it's, it's really important. And I think maybe um, this time might help, help people see that. Yeah, so I, I have sites in Chile and Peru that I've gone back to repeatedly over, in some cases, close to 15 years. Um, but I haven't seen really long-term changes there. There, the big dynamic is these are hyper-arid places, and so it can go 15, 20 years without rain. And I've been lucky to see it in the years when it rains. And that's just, it's amazing to watch this landscape that I thought I knew completely change. In one, one case, I buried my equipment in what was an open space between two trees and came back and there were these six foot plants growing over the two inches of dirt <laughs> that, that buried my instrument boxes. And it was lucky that I'd been there so many times I could even find them because there was just nothing, nothing there. And those, that's off of a single rainfall that's then maintained by fog water to sort of tie it back into my sort of Biases on like these things persist for months off of fog and dew after growing off of a single rainfall event, which is kind of neat. Um, on a change scale, though, 
I've been working on this project in the Ecuadorian Andes for just a couple of years. And I've only been down there three times over the past two years. And yet every time we go down there, the glacier that we work on has moved upslope noticeably. And that's kind of terrifying in that this isn't a place that I know all that well. And yet even with that, I can see the change. You can see, oh yeah, it was down past these rocks a year ago. And now it's 20, 30 feet up. And that's, that's really striking when we're there working on how that retreat is going to affect water resources downstream. Simon, we've had a, a little flurry of questions in the in the run up. I think people are seeing the time and they're like, I got to ask my question. So um, Veda wants to know, is there research going on all winter on lakes, marshes, and the rivers at the Itasca Field Station? And if so, how many researchers and how many people are working on those kind of projects? Yeah, no, we, so we do have um, that kind of research going on during the winter time at the station. It varies year to year, um, but I'd say um, anywhere from a, a couple projects up to maybe um, say six or so, um, we've had some examples. We've had um, researchers from the um, Science Museum of Minnesota come from the St. Croix, oh, what's the watershed uh, research center, um, who have been looking at changes in the sediments. And so they've gotten ice cores um, out, or not ice cores, they've gotten sediment cores um, out on the ice. Um, we've had folks looking at greenhouse gas greenhouse gases and how ice uh, might trap some of that and the buildup under under the ice and the water. Um, even things like uh, what kind of critters, the little microscopic critters that you have in in the lake, um, what what are they doing over the, that time of year. So we we have a wide variety of researchers and and also too they're not all with like with the Science Museum, they're not all with the University of Minnesota, so uh, we uh, welcome people from lots of different institutions from the from the country, even even Iowa State comes in different places. So yeah, it's pretty active. Cool. Um, I want to ask one last question before we sign off for the afternoon. So look into your crystal balls. Let's pretend like you have crystal balls. And I'm curious what you each think about what lines of research are most exciting to be thinking about or looking ahead. What's the most exciting research, um, the stuff that has the most promise? What's going to be making headlines, particularly with respect to, um, to water and ice and those interactions between plants, plants and, um, and the environment? Go. Maybe I'll give you go first, Daniel, or? <laughs> okay, I'll take a, a terrible stab at this. These are, <laughs> these are terrifying questions as what cautious scientists, but. I'm <laughs> pushing I you. Think, yeah, I think one of the really huge pieces is going to be figuring out how to not just piece together sort of what goes on at a local plant scale to how that affects like, water flux in and out of an ecosystem, but to make sure that we can do that, figure out how to do that for more than just one or two typical kinds of plants, but in a way that captures the range of variation that we see. Because even in a forest, the trees are very different from each other. There's sort of, there's a whole natural variation that up, up until now we had to, by necessity, kind of smush into a single idealized tree, a single idealized grass, and understanding, finding both the biology understanding, but also the computer science and physics ways of handling that added complexity and nuance is going to make a huge shift in, in how we do these things. That's good. All right, Leslie. Yeah, and I think for me, it would be trying to put it all together in terms of, um, you know, we focused in on the summer a lot in the, in the lake world and expanding our knowledge in the winter is really important. Um, in terms of how ecosystems, you know, function. And so putting it together, like what do these changes in the winter uh, mean for the summer? And then also, there's also changes that I didn't talk about going on in the summertime. So then how in turn does that go back to the winter? But then putting the human part into it, 
So there's going to be feedbacks um, and relationships between how these changes in the lake might affect people's activities, which in turn would affect the lake again. So really trying to put it all together. I don't know that that'll make the headline, like you said, because that's a lot of a lot going on. But but I think that's a really um, important area, though, is to try to put put these seasons and people and the ecosystem into the same picture uh, more completely. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank you both for um, excellent presentations and a great conversation. Everybody out there watching, let's give a round of applause. Uh, silently wave your hands from, from where you're, you're sitting. Um, I'd like to tell our audience today too to be on the lookout for a brief survey that, that will come from us tomorrow. Uh, we'd really appreciate hearing your feedback about this event and how we can be better, um, do better in uh, future events. And I hope you all consider joining us next week for our final installment of the season of Probable Meets Possible. So next Wednesday, May 27th at 4 p.m. We will, um, this, the theme is not business as usual and we'll feature Dr. Jessica Hellman and Dr. David Bankston. So you can RSVP and you'll see the Z link on the screen there, z.umn.edu slash bio and business. So uh, next week, four o'clock, uh, and we'll have another lineup. So thank you all for joining us. Take good care. Enjoy that little bit of sunshine that's left today. Have a good one. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.